first time, fill out the connection card uh, or scan the code on the back of the chair and let us know this is your first time. Stop out and pick up a gift we have for you at Connections. Um, what will be happening today is that we actually have the privilege of Jen sharing the message for us today. All right, Jen. So let's have some words and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for seeing us safely. Thank you for filling us with your light and your love and let us be a beacon to the world. Let us be filled with your word today that you bring to us through Jen and let us carry it out into the world. Everything that you wish for us and want for us. In your holy name, amen.
face shine upon me. Be gracious to me, Lord, turn his face toward you.
are thankful for the blood of Jesus. Come on. How many of you this morning are thankful for the blood of Jesus? Come on. Are you born again this morning? Because why? Because of the blood. Amen? Come on. If I ever had a church, if I did, but pastor ever had a church that could really, really grasp blood of Jesus did for us. Man, he couldn't get us to stop. Amen. He couldn't get us to sit down. One day. Amen. Amen. So greet someone. Let them know you're glad to be here this morning. Give them a high five. And you can be seated. Welcome. My name is Jen, for those of you that don't know. And those of you that don't know, I'm Pastor's older sister. So I got some stories. <laughs> but that's for another Sunday, amen. Youth, you can be dismissed. Today is uh, Youth Sunday. So if you're in the house, in the room here this morning, you can be dismissed with Pastor Travis and Kiera. So, how many have any plans on November the 17th? Raise your hand. Every, every hand in this house should be up. November 17th, 7 p.m. So, what, it's a Wednesday, right? Oh, no, that's practice. It's a Friday, sorry. Friday, Wednesday, oh, what am I saying? Friday, November 17th at 7 p.m. Be in the house. We're having a night of praise and worship, of Thanksgiving. Pastor is going to lead us in worship that night. So if you've never sat under the anointing of Pastor James leading us in praise and worship, you have missed out. Yes, Amen? Yes. So be here. Amen. Be here in the house. Yes. I think it's important that um, not only in every Sunday, but any time that the doors are open, that we have an opportunity to come in and corporately get, come together um, and praise and worship. We ought to be here. Amen? Amen. So, I mean, we would set aside an hour and a half any other night to watch our favorite show. I think uh, he's worth setting aside an hour on a Friday night to, to worship him. Amen? So I'm looking around, and I'm taking inventory. Camera, you can pan. Let him know. Every face should be here. Amen? Invite a friend. Invite someone. I encourage you. Okay. Are you ready for the word this morning? Okay. Buckle in. Ushers, lock the doors. Okay? I got a word this morning. I'm going to teach, okay? I'm, I love, I, I think I flow in the gifting of a Bible teacher. So the word that I believe God has for you this morning is, um, it's a teaching word. But how many of you know there's a scripture that says that my people perish because of a lack of knowledge? So it's my responsibility this morning to bring you a word in due season, so that you don't perish spiritually and maybe physically. Amen? Amen? So, Father God, I just give this service to you, Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start off. A title of my message today is called The Real Me. The Real Me. And we're going to start off reading in Exodus chapter 20. And I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. It should be up on the screens for you here momentarily. And it says this. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He don't like to share. That's what that says. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. I'm going to read that again. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third 
and fourth generations of those who hate me. In that scripture, he's talking about not serving any other God. That's a familiar piece of scripture, hopefully. That's the context of this particular commandment. Why did he hang visiting the iniquities on that commandment? Why did he hang it on thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not steal? Why did he hang that little phrase on that one? And here's why. Because serving any other God is not the context of that movie that you watch where you see some Israelites going through the wilderness and they, you know, there's a cow that they build, right? I believe today in our time, it's actually something different. I think most of us today are in trouble or in the possibility of idol worship. <coughs> stay, stay seated. Because what I think is happening today is we're building a Jesus in our minds that's not the real one. We don't erect images like in that scripture today, like carved images, right? But images in our mind of a Jesus that we want to serve and that fits our lifestyle. Come on. In other words, we don't seek out the true Jesus and then live as he would have us to live. Instead, we seek out the way that we want to live, and then we find a church that preaches that Jesus to us. Come on, it's quiet here in the house. All right. So that's why people go church hunting. It's because I've figured out how I want to live. Now I've got to find the preacher that preaches it. Instead of who is Jesus, what does he say, and then making sure that my life shifts to line up with that. Amen? I can't shift Jesus to look like me. And if you ever looked at the history of religions, you'll see there's always, a, uh, the God is always a human times 20. Think, you know, think of things that you learned in school and all those uh, religions. Because people have constantly wanted to make God like them. They want to serve some image of a human that's just bigger than them. But how many of you know the scripture says, says that God says, I am not like you. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. He wants to raise us to become like him instead of us in our mind making him like us. Do you understand that? That's the world that we live in. So he says when you begin to serve images in that scripture... You begin to let your life go in a direction where you're serving a God that's not him. And when you do that, there's something that's getting planted in the bloodline. So if I choose not to just make a mistake, but instead to live out a pattern, a cyclical, ongoing pattern of sin in my life, the Bible says, that I, Jen Boer, would be creating a system in her bloodline that would visit my children, that would visit my grandchildren, and that would visit my great-grandchildren. Are you seeing that? In fact, my actions are so powerful that there can be children who have never met me that wake up one day fighting devils that began in my life. That's a powerful responsibility to have. If you have kids, I implore you, wake up this morning. If you have grandchildren, great-grandchildren, wake up. This is a timely word. To understand that hidden sins, private sins, or lifestyles that I allow, and I'm not talking about that I messed up last night and, oh, dang it, I missed the mark again. And I'm not talking that. I'm talking about ongoing patterns of sin. Do you see? Okay, we're going to talk about the difference of that. I want you to understand there is a difference. 
that those things, those ongoing private patterns of sin will visit the generations that I have not even met. In other words, we don't sin in a vacuum. There's no way that sin only affects you. There's no way that my sin only affects me. It affects those around us. And it affects those connected to me and born out of me and you. If you remember, Pastor taught us a few weeks ago, we are a three-part being, right? We're a body that has a spirit and a soul. And when we get saved, that first dimension of our being, are, are you all right? Are you getting this this morning? Yeah, no. Okay. You're just like real like, it's because you're, you're, you're getting it, right? Okay. Yeah. That first part of our being, the spirit being, that spirit dimension, when you get saved, that part of your person is perfected. The moment you pray the prayer, period, it's done, you can't increase upon it, that part of your being is perfected. You agree with me? Yeah. Amen? Okay. Spiritually, you've been made alive. Spiritually, you've been positioned right with God, and you've become the righteousness of God in a moment. Yeah. In a moment. In Christ, all the requirements of the law have been fulfilled the moment that we put our faith in Jesus. Positionally, we're all set. We've been made right with him. But there's that other dimension, the soul dimension. That's a real booger, right? What happens in an instant in our spirit realm? This is a place, I need you to get this. Where that, that soul realm, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, if you're taking notes, I mean, there's your spirit, there's your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, okay? It's in this realm that you find the seed of our passions. It's the root of our desires. It's where we file away all of our experiences in this soul realm. It's where we form our thinking and of, of what we've been taught, the neighborhood where we've been raised, what our mom and dads have showed us, maybe what our grandfather, or not mine, but yours, <laughs> fishing, and put, instilled into you. How many of you know that, you, that we, you and I are not born racist? Do you know that? It's, it's implanted and put in us in that soul realm. It's the words and the people that we're listening to, right? It's those thoughts and ideas that we file and store away in that part of our being as a child. No one is born a racist. But it goes to show how important that soul realm is and who you allow to speak into your life. Because words take roots. And that's what we're going to talk about in this soul realm is these roots that we deal with that go so deep that we can have a genuine experience and come to the altar and give our life to, to Christ and walk away and never experience the blessing that he has for us here and that he can renew this, that realm that I'm talking about with his help. 1 Peter 1.9 says that he's the author and finisher of our faith, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. And in that, it says it's not the saving our, of our spirit that's the end of our salvation. It's the saving of our soul. He wants to get, God wants to get into that second dimension, that soul realm of our being. Jesus took care of letting me be born of the Spirit and wiping away my sins. But me handling my mind, my will, my emotions, my experiences, my passions, my desires, my impulses, me having those areas of my life cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus and set up rightly in alignment with God, that requires our participation. That's what I'm saying. You can have a genuine experience at the altar 
but it's that second realm that requires our participation. Amen? Amen. So why God says, I'll handle everything in that first dimension, we've got to work together to clean up that second one. And I believe that that's what's going wrong today in this generation is just that. It's that mixture. I've given my life to Christ, but I haven't dealt with anything in this soul realm. And so you're living a life of mixture. You're working so hard to be led by the Spirit, but you've got things that haven't been dealt with. You've got people who ask, who am I? What am I here for? Am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Am I holy or am I not? Am I an evil person? This mixture, this tug of war between these realms that we deal with. Come on, I know I'm not the only one, right? All right, okay. We all have mixture. We all deal with this mixture. Just like that first realm took death, burial, and resurrection, the same thing has to happen in our soul realm. It takes death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? Amen? Now, in that second dimension, something gets buried in that second dimension, and it's called iniquity. How many of you have ever heard that word before? I mean, we read it in the scripture. When we take communion, we hear the scripture that he was, that he bled for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Notice he didn't say in that scripture that he visits the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. He says iniquity. And we need to understand what is that? What is iniquity? Here's what it is. Sinful acts or transgressions, they're something that's acted upon, executed. They take place, meaning you miss the mark. You ask forgiveness for it. You repent Holy Spirit, help me not to do that again, and you move on. That's a sin. That's a transgression, okay? Sin is not iniquity. If you lost your temper last night, God's not going to visit that on your great-grandchildren, okay? That's, again, you you repent. Oh, I missed it. I missed the mark. Holy Spirit, help me, right? And we go again. You bring that under the blood. That's not iniquity. I'm talking about the things that are hidden. And iniquities are dangerous because they're underneath the ground. They're underground. We're great at pointing out people's sinful acts. Come on, ouchie. But we're terrible at finding out why. If, you've ever, if you could ever find out why, then maybe we'd have a little bit more grace toward the person. Oh, did you see what they did yesterday? I heard what they said. Don't let your kids go in that Sunday school class that Sunday. I'm I'm, I'm being real. We're great at pointing out other people's sins. We don't know what's been underground, and we don't know how long it's been underground. That's why the scripture says, judge not lest you be judged. I don't, I don't know what they've been dealing with and how long they've been dealing with it. It is not my place to judge somebody, right? Do you understand that? It is not our place to judge because it says the same measure that we judge someone else, it'll be, it'll be measured out to us. And Lord knows I ain't trying to have that kind of judgment. Now, the word iniquity, it means to be bent or twisted. If you look up the word iniquity, the Hebrew word iniquity means to be bent or bent or twisted. I'd have you stand up and bend and twist, but we won't do that today. Iniquity means bent or twisted. The scripture says, I will visit your bentness. I will visit your being twisted. To your kids, your great-grandkids. When Adam sinned, everybody was born twisted. Everybody was born bent. What's that mean? When you came into this world, when I came into this world, 
we were twisted. We were bent. Have you ever made a bad decision and never understood what was driving that bad decision? That's what we're doing this morning is I'm trying to bring some revelation to some of the things that we do and we don't even know why we're doing them. We seemingly just don't have the power to stop sometimes. We've seen people that have been in sin who desperately, desperately, desperately want to get out and they don't know how. It's these, this bentness, this twistedness are so deeply rooted in this soul realm. And what the devil would love nothing more is to keep you focused on those physical things and not understand iniquities, how dangerous they are, but you don't have to live with them. They don't have to be a part of who you are. He'd love you to just to stay out here and, start, and keep swinging at this stuff and not dealing with the hidden stuff. When the baby comes out of that birth canal, right, and they're wiping all that afterbirth off and they're giving it to the mother, that baby is born already bent and twisted. That innocent little ball of life is already bent, twisted toward a particular lifestyle. That baby's been taught nothing. That baby has learned nothing. It's seen nothing. It's experienced nothing. But the wheels are already turning inside of that baby toward a specific proclivity in life that he'll have to, or he or she'll have to deal with and fight. And it has nothing to do with him. It came through the iniquity visited in the bloodline. Are you getting this? Okay. You didn't just get your dad's brown eyes or your mom's olive skin. The physical features from our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. These are seen things. What we're wrestling against is stuff that we got from mommy and daddy that we can't see. And it has nothing to do with those physical, those physical inher inher things that we inherit. There's so much more. It has to do with this twistedness that we were all born into this world with. I believe this morning, in this room and watching online, that there's some of you that deal with alcoholism. Alcoholism ran all through your family. And you don't understand maybe why this thing doesn't bother you or that thing doesn't bother you. But man, if you just get around alcohol, it just sucks you in. And you know that it's wrong, right? You're saved. You've come and you've prayed the prayer. And you don't like this. It's twisted. It's that bentness. Maybe some of us have never dealt with that, but we deal with addiction. Right? It's, that's what I'm saying. We don't ever look at someone and say, not you, but I'm, you know. <laughs> I can't believe that. Because you don't know what their mama and daddy and granddaddy and grandmama and great-grandmama, <laughs> what they dealt with. How many of you know things that were dealt with in a prior generation people didn't talk about? Right. Lifestyle sins? perversions, you didn't talk about it. You might have known granddaddy had this issue, but nobody talked about it. And how many of you know, if you don't address something in one generation, it will be bigger in the next. What was hidden in one generation cannot be hidden in another one. Can you look through? I mean, just look back, back past the last 10, 20 years. The things that the world says that are okay now 10, 15 years ago, shh, shh. But if you don't have this and this commercial and you don't portray that and that television show and you don't, you don't have all these things. Come on. 
It's that bentness, that twistedness. Maybe it's broken relationships that you just, you're looking back and you're like, man, why can't I just have a solid? You look back and you realize that maybe divorce runs in your family. Or there's just relational issues in your family. Nobody trusts anyone. There's bitterness, there's strife, there's anger, there's backbiting. and bleh, bleh, bleh. They don't talk to each other for 30, 40 years. Come on, I'm being real. Something full-blown in this generation. It means granddaddy probably didn't deal with it. And then by the time it hits our life, maybe two generations later, it is so big and powerful inside of us. And it is such a driving force that it's causing actions that you and I have trouble hiding. And we have trouble containing it. But this morning, I believe that if you take those things and you bring them into the light, God says you can break them. Amen? The torment can leave. All the hiding can, can go. God said he has something better for us. Amen. We don't have to just say, well, my daddy dealt with it. Well, I guess it is what it is. How many of you know that we, it can stop with us? Because yeah. I can't believe that living a particular lifestyle or twistedness is God's highest form for us. There's something far better and greater that he has. Psalm 40, verse 12 says this. For innumerable, for innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities, this is David, the iniquities, things driving me from the inside that are controlling my life. He says they've overtaken me. And I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Oh, by the way, this is David, a man after God's own heart. Moses, who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He was a fugitive for 40 years because of murder. The Psalms, many of them were written while David was still in an affair. Not before or after, but in it. Your Bible, what you're reading, it's full of people who dealt with deep-rooted iniquities. That's what he says. And, and look what it, what it says. They've overtaken me. How many of you have ever felt like, man, this has just, I feel overtaken I can't get out of it. I've dug myself so far in a hole with this. I don't, it's going to take a supernatural act of God to get me out. I've been in places like that. And I've even surrendered saying, well, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. It's just, it seems too bigger than me. It's easier to give in and give up. And maybe God will do it in the next song or whatever. Right. And we're waiting for a like he did in the, in the spirit realm. We're waiting for just a supernatural moment. And he does do that. Don't get me wrong. I've been in services where people have been miraculously set free from addiction or walked away from a certain type of lifestyle. He can do it. I'm not discounting that. But if he doesn't or until he does, it is our responsibility to deal with it. It really is. Paul didn't say before he got saved. He said after he got saved, he said this, that he was the chief of all sinners. He said, I'm the best sinner in the world, and he wrote half of our New Testament. The reason I tell you that this morning is because how many of you know that God can use you and me even on our worst day? He can turn things around. And this morning, it's not a, a, a message of condemnation where you're sitting here and you're like, Dang, I really am messed up. I mean, maybe you are. We are, you know. But what I'm saying is it's not enough for God to say, I can't use you. You're unusable. 
What you're struggling with this morning can be your testimony to the very power of God. And he can raise you up out of it and do something great in your life. What the first father, Adam, in the flesh twisted up and got, got us bent. You know, when Adam sinned, right? Sin entered the world, entered the bloodstream, if you will, because we're all born out of Adam. Because of that, sin like I said, that little baby that we were born with has got us twisted and bent. Jesus told a man named Nicodemus, you must be born again. Isn't that interesting? The way God's designed it is that you have to be born again. Because Adam screwed up our first birth. Right? We need to be born again. So I came into this world twisted, but I get born again, and what happens? God starts to be, he begins to start to untwist some things in our life, right? Now, where does iniquity flow? In the bloodline. And what did Jesus spill? His blood. Are you getting it? Thank you. You got it. You got it. She got it. The Bible says in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. That's a ridiculous statement because women don't have seed. But all the way back in Genesis, listen, right after the fall, God said, don't worry. I've got something planned. When Adam sinned, it wasn't, oh, man, what am I going to do? It's okay. I got something else planned. And he says in the scripture, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent will bruise his heel. In other words, the serpent will win temporarily, but the seed of the woman will crush him eternally. God said, in that, I will begin to untwist you what Adam messed up. God will begin to untwist. And the authority that the iniquity had in, in our life to ruin our life will be broken. And you'll know the freedom because the scripture says, who the son is set free is free indeed. Can I keep going? Are you getting that? All right. The angel came to Mary and said, the Holy Ghost will overshadow you and you'll conceive. For those science nerds, or not nerds, but you know, people that really enjoy that biology, who determines the bloodline? What? The male, the father, determines, or not bloodline, blood type, sorry. The father determines the blood type. Come on, you, this is all... This is all physical stuff that I'm talking about. But I'm asking you to put on your spiritual ears this morning because it's not just a text. This is, this is science lines up with the word of God. Amen? Amen. And that's what, that's what I'm trying to get you to see this morning. The male determines the blood type. So for Jesus to come and to take on the form of flesh... The woman had to be that connection to the flesh. The seed didn't come from Mary. Where did it come from? God. But God needed a woman, flesh, to put the seed into to carry the seed to fruition. That's why when I said, I mean, women don't carry, I mean, we don't have seed. So Mary didn't didn't have, she wasn't a hundred, you know, she needed something else. That's what I'm saying, okay? God had to be the connection to the blood because the blood could not be tainted. It's the seed from the male carries the blood type. And he couldn't use Mary's, right? And he couldn't use Joseph's, why? 
It was tainted blood. They were born bent. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. So the seed came from God into the womb, which came from a woman, and out came a God-man who was not half and half. He was not half God and half man. He was all God, and he was all man because his blood was untainted and it came from heaven. Are you getting this? Why in the Old Testament, when, you, when they sinned, there were stipulations. You messed up. You bring me. I'm just, this is my version, okay? You bring me three turtle dove. I don't know. But they had to be perfect. You bring me a, whatever. And a lot of it had to do with the type of sin. There were different sacrifices that were required to cover, not take away, cover temporarily so God didn't have to see it, sin, bentness, iniquity. But it had to be a perfect, spotless. Jesus was our perfect, spotless Lamb, that perfected blood from heaven that just didn't come to cover our sin. Come on. He, it washes it away. Amen? You can't fix dirty blood with dirty blood. So when the blood of Jesus was spilt, which was determined by the male, which came from heaven, and not his mom. Do you understand? Jesus was releasing a whole new genetic code. Amen. A whole new genetic code when his blood was spilled out for you and for me. Come on, this is good stuff. Are you getting this? I want you to walk out of here today so spiritually muscled up because what maybe you walked in with this morning, I'm telling, I mean, it's just. <laughs> You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live stuck and dealing with things. These deep, rooted, I can't let nobody see them. I can't let nobody in church know. Come on. These things that we carry around. He's released, he released a whole new genetic code. To redefine characteristics, to redefine conduct, to redefine personality traits, to redefine our passions and our desires. Come on. Everything that we deal with in that soulless realm that is not of him, he has released a whole new genetic code yes. that can eradicate that. Yes. Yes. And we don't have to live according to our granddaddy's old corruptible desires. He spilled his spotless blood. You no longer have to operate according to the old DNA that was given to you. You have a brand new DNA which came from heaven, and it's untainted. It is unblemished. It's incorruptible. It's immortal. And when it begins to flow through your life, the power to change has come. Amen. But you've got to let it flow. Tim, you can come a while. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5, <coughs> says this. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem, esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. We've heard that scripture. We've memorized that scripture. We've prayed that scripture. 
Do you notice that he puts peace was purchased right after the iniquity was dealt with? He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Why? Because operating in that thing will destroy the peace in your life. Everything that we will ever need was finished on the cross. And we need to understand that. It's so much more than just coming and giving our life to him and walking away and we are on our way to heaven. And we're just going to, what, suffer through until we get there? He's paid such a higher price. That people, that's what I'm, that people will walk around with just this mixture. But he's paid for so much more. It says that God dealt with your sins and our outward and our outward acts, those transgressions, those things, those outward acts that people see. Man, I lost my temper last month. My husband can witness it. That's what that scripture says. He was wounded for our transgressions, those sins that you can see. But it says that he was bruised for our iniquities. Those driving pulses that we wish that we could get rid of. If I took a razor blade and I, I was going to say cut my wrist, but that's not good. I don't want to get that out of your mind. Okay. If I took, if I fell, okay, and I skinned my knee, right, and I've opened up my flesh, what happens? I have an open wound. I'm bleeding, right? A transgression is a sin that everybody can see. What did, so what's the scripture say? He was wounded. He bled openly for the sins that we see. So, my prayer is you never, ever read or this scripture ever in the same way again. He, was, he openly bled for those sins that we can see. But the next part of the scripture, it says that he was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquities are those hidden sins that you can't see or you can easily hide. We can easily hide a bruise, right? What is a bruise? What is it? It's a bleeding from the inside. Under the skin. A bruise. He was bruised for the sins, those hidden sins, if you will. Amen? Come on, are you getting this? Those iniquities, the hidden sins, the bruise, the internal bleeding. It's the blood that removes the sinful stain. Amen? Am I right? There's no remission of sin without blood being shed. So he bled on the outside for what you did on the outside, but he was bruised on the inside for what we're struggling with, and what we don't want, want to let anybody see. You can stand to your feet this morning. The struggle that embarrasses you, this, that torments you, that you try to hide, that you're trying to cover, that you don't want anyone to see and you sure can't expose it at church. But this morning, oh, for a church that would allow him to peer into our bruises, those hidden spaces. Amen. My prayer is that Hope City would be a church that would not only help people deal with the, the what's, what you did. Maybe that outward stuff. So you're okay, maybe sharing. Man, I did this this week. But my prayer is that Hope City would be a church that would be so that the, the, the heart of the church would be to find out the why. The why. Why?
we're going to close with a song, and I just feel that uh, if there, left some of the prayer team up here, but if there's anyone here in the house, and even those of you that are online, there's ways to kind of connect with the church and a pastor and let us know, and we will pray and agree with you. But if there's anyone in the house this morning, and you're saying, man, this message hit me. Okay, I get it now. I get it. And I don't want to walk out of here just dealing and being okay and being not okay. I'd like our prayer team just to pray with you. And if you've already prayed, like Pastor said before, man, I've been praying for years, okay? Then we're just going to agree. We don't have to keep praying. We, we, we learned about that, right? We pray once, we heard a prayer. After that, it's a prayer of agreement. We come in alignment with that prayer that you prayed, and we're going to stand and we're going to agree with you. So we're going to bring the house lights down. And this is, I want this to be a very, a space. Holy Spirit, help me here. A place of freedom where you can come here this morning and you can lay it down once and for all and walk away. Maybe not that you'll ever be tempted again. Because, you know, Satan is not a... He can't create anything. You know that. Satan has no creative ability whatsoever. All he can do is, is, is lie, steal, and cheat. And you may have to walk out of here and deal with some stuff daily. But the prayer has been prayed. The price has been paid. And maybe you need to go back and ask the Holy Spirit, help me pinpoint, where, where did this come from? And I'll show, show you. But we can't just keep passing it from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation. To generation. Amen. So as we just close the service with this song, I just ask that you just remain in an attitude of worship as those that want prayer or to stand in agreement with make their way up. But don't walk out of here a prisoner, please. Don't walk out of here when the keys of freedom are here. They are here this morning. Amen.